Hello, golf fans, and welcome to another Roto Pros PGA preview video. I'm Chris Terrell, and joining me, as always, the other member of our PGA team, Dane Chenault. How's it going tonight, buddy? It's going great. Coming off a pretty good week, a fun week all around. Capped off by the Super Bowl last night, so ready to hop into some Pebble Beach. Well, First that's... week without football to worry about. Oh, I know. It's uh, it, it really feels weird. That season, it actually now feels like it really went really fast like i remember the draft and thinking i don't even know if the season's gonna happen and uh here we are super bowl's all over and tom brady won another super bowl <laughs> who would have figured uh, uh, but yeah you uh you yeah, mentioned last week surprising. you mentioned last week and that's where i'm going to start here uh you kind of had a little bit of an amazing run yesterday especially um i know at one point we were talking you had bet james hahn uh i what was I forget what the odds were you had on that one, but it was like a fourteen hundred dollar payout if he had won. And mid ball in the air before it went in the water, you had cashed out, took it like a seventeen x profit on that thing. Ball hits the water, those odds are gone. You followed that up by hitting your fifty to one Brooks, like just amazing. Oh, I've never ran so good. I, I don't or haven't in a very long time. I feel like, um, and it was. We were, we were talking about it weeks on end before that how unlucky just like little bitty things throughout the week we were having happen to us, whether it's showdown or, or week long people like barely missing the cut and things, which it happened again for me. I, I had a five of six in week long for DFS with Ricky missing the cut. Yeah, me too. Um, tried making a run on Friday, but um, I, I would have had a big, big week if Ricky makes a cut. But as far as as betting, I had four outrights last week, Sung Jay, Brooks, Ricky, and uh, Zalatoris is the four I went with kind of in that mid-range. Um, so I'm going in to Sunday, and I'm like, I had a couple outside shots with Brooks. I mean, he was five back, and then Zalatoris was right in there too, mm -hmm. five or six back. Um, I had the, the top six each way on both of those. So I'm, I was feeling decent about that, after, especially after the way Brooks finished on Saturday. Um, and then I come, I'm, I'm just looking at the board on Sunday morning, and Han was tied with Brooks, playing in the same group, five back. Um, and he was 66 to one on the book that I opened. And I didn't think much more about it because um, I was like, I. I not really going to jump on that. And then I see Pat Mayo tweet that he's betting him at a hundred to one. And I'm like, am I missing something here? And I start scanning around and I get to FanDuel and he was a hundred to one on FanDuel. I'm like, I got to jump in <laughs> after I almost did. Um, so I put that in hundred to one, put 14 or 15 bucks on it. I can't exactly remember. Um, but like you said, it's going to cash out like 1400. He takes like a three shot lead and I'm, I should have cashed it out then um, for like half, it was like six or 700, I think. Um, got a little greedy. I'm like three shot lead. I knew a lot could happen. But like you said, he, he, come, he started stumbling a little bit starting on 11. Um, and he almost chipped it in the water oh, coming yeah. across on his third on 11. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And I was about to click the cash out button as the <laughs> ball was rolling across the green there. So I had the cash out button open for like the next four holes. And he gets to 15. And I'm like, all right, he's got to make a birdie after he bogeyed 13. Um, so he hits it in the fairway. I'm like, okay, he's got a chance. Brooks piped it. He was making a little bit of a run at that point. He birdied two in a row. Um, but Han gets over his ball and he hits it. And as soon as he hits it, he drops his club. Yep. And as soon as he dropped that club, I go to my phone and I'm like, cash out, cash <laughs> out, <laughs> cash out. And I can't believe it actually let me. Um, right. Cause it usually six. it'll, it'll have like a three or second delay or something to see what's going to happen. Right. And then approve it. That's right. Insane. Yeah. So cash me out at 16 to one for 240, 250, somewhere right in there. Um, so I was feeling pretty good about that. And then it just instantly shifted to let's hope Han don't pull something out of his rear end and, and make par here and then birdie in or something. And right. And Kill really both tickets. Me. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it instantly flipped to let's get Brooks going. So he hits a, he hits a close one in there on 15 and I was hoping he would roll that in, but he, he missed it and then par 16 
Uh, but I was st- still feeling pretty good. But man, when he chipped that one in, that was beautiful. I about lost it. That, that was, was it was an awesome, awesome sweat all around. He um, did the, the jumped me up pretty high in DFS too with the five and six. So. As soon as he put that putter up in the air, I was like, "Yeah, he's got it. That's game. Game oh, set yeah. match. Back up the truck." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was interesting, especially to see Xander. Um, I mean, he's kind of fell into that group with Finau of can't close. But Unreal. I never really felt like he was on that level of not being able to close. Like, he always kind of seems like he's the yeah. steady guy that right. can get it done. Um, but, man, he was given every chance come Sunday um, from everybody just blowing, blowing up around him, really. He says um, – one thing I heard was he 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 puts too much pressure on himself and he gets it's almost like he gets too amped up inside and then he just starts making those dumb little mistakes like uh, when he did that that terrible little chip he got bogey on that hole I forget it was like fourteen I think just a terrible chip and he just he's just overthinking things I think on Sundays yeah um, something I guess to watch going forward Definitely. especially. He's going to be in the mix in a bunch of tournaments. So, yeah, I'm right. He is. He'll get it done eventually, but something to think about for sure. Well, before we jump into the picks for this week, before we jump into this week's event, I'll tell you a little bit about Roto Pros. If uh, you guys or anyone watching is new, each week uh, you can find the free preview article, Dane's Darts, up on the website. That comes out. Uh, uh, Tuesdays, and then t- we're going to try and keep this video going every Monday. We're going to try and preview, uh, record it on Monday night, hopefully out later Monday night, early Wednesday or Tuesday morning, sorry, uh, depending on my editing ability uh, going forward. And if you want to take it to the next level, you can grab a free trial with a weekly, monthly, or yearly subscription. Get access to our PGA Cheat Sheet, which has top cash game, GPP, and value plays on it in each price range, along with our top three to five players in each price range. We do rank those for you every week. Um, the same sheet is also updated throughout the tournament for showdown. This includes live live uh, pre-round odds for rounds two, three, and four, updated turn- in tourney stats, updated model, and top picks for each, as well as skeletons for rounds two, three, and four as well. Um, it also gives you access to our Slack chat. That's where the key information comes in. We give you pretty much up-to-the-minute updates, withdraws, weather, when it comes to golf, um, other sports as well, but for golf specifically, we look at the weather Wednesday night. We kind of go over things Wednesday night before early locks on Thursday. Um, and uh, skeleton lineups as well, like I mentioned, those come out Wednesday night. And that just kind of gives you an idea of what our cores are going to be. And if you know you're someone that's maybe strapped for time, those skeletons can really get you started on the right uh, right form every week. Get going. And we also have free rolls. Um, this week, the free roll uh, just happens to be for PGA. All you have to do, like the comment or sorry, like the comment, like the video, comment below with your favorite DFS play this week, along with your DK handle, I will get you in that free roll. Um, we have five bucks for the winner, as well as five leaderboard points, and then three leader point, three leaderboard points for second, and then one leaderboard point for third. Every 25 leaderboard points is 15 bucks to you. All right, let's dive into the tournament here. So we've got at t Pebble Beach, uh, minus the Pro-Am this year due to COVID, of course. Because of that, they're only running two courses this year, the Pebble Beach Golf Links as well as Spyglass. So they're going to play one round on each Thursday and Friday, and then Pebble Beach will be the course they play Saturday, Sunday. Um, anything that you're looking at specifically this week, myself, with three three of the four rounds, I'm going to be concentrating most of my stats on Pebble, but I'll let you dive in here, and uh, what do you got? Yeah, it's when we come to this course, the first thing that pops into my mind is uh, – um, the, the small greens, and that's even more uh, pronounced this year because Spyglass and Pebble Beach are, are always the smallest, some of the smallest greens on tour. Um, and now we get rid of Monterey, which is the easiest of the three courses, um, I believe. Um, and now we have uh, Pebble Beach and Spyglass just the first two days. I'm, I'm glad uh, we talked about this a few weeks ago. I'm, I'm glad we only have a two course rotation and no um six hour rounds oh yeah um and we get a, a normal cut uh, so it's going to be interesting but yeah i'm, I'm targeting approach guys because because you, i mean it t- off the tee is important uh you need to be in position but it's usually not a course it's a course that you need to have your wedges dialed in coming into those greens on your second shots um very short courses here i mean right around seven thousand yards um for both of these 
Um, and you just got to get it on those greens and you can make putts from anywhere on them because they are so small. So what are some of the things you're looking at? I'm main thing for me is approach, approach play around the green comes in a little bit more here. Um, and that wedge play. So the proximity from like 125 to 150 right in there to get those wedges, uh, dialed in for people. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm with you on stroke skin approach by far the most important here with the smaller greens, especially pebble They're smallest on tour average, like 3,500 square feet spyglass 5,000. I think average on tour is actually right around 6,500 somewhere in there, six to 65. So I agree. Small greens <clears throat> approach is going to be key. That's where the guys are going to separate themselves. It was interesting looking at the approach shot data from fantasy national this week um, on, I just did pebble specifically and I haven't seen it. Usually we're going to see like two ranges close together that are taking up like a large majority of the approach shots, like say 150 to 175 and 175 to 200 or the two long range uh, irons or, but this week's a little bit different at pebble, uh, the hundred to 125 range, 22% and the 200 plus range, 21% everything in between is right around 14, 15%. So it kind of makes sense with some of the short holes. If we start breaking down the course here, um, look, I've got it up here on the screen. We've got six holes on pebble that are under 400 yards and four on spyglass that are under 400 yards. So that's 10 holes uh, under 400 yards. So that's where your short approaches are going to come from. And then just with, you know, guys trying to, you, you don't really get a lot of bombers here. Usually you get a lot of short hitters. So that's kind of where I take that information from and feel that that long iron proximity. So if you're looking at guys that hit it a little bit longer, maybe concentrate more on the mid range um, to the, to the short. And then for your uh, shorter hitters, kind of look at those uh, long range proximity ranges. But other than that, I think around the green, especially in my cash game model is going to be weighted a little bit just because of the small greens that are out there. I think uh, scrambling is going to be important for guys not to lose too many strokes to the field um, because of if they're not hitting the green. Obviously, for upside, approach is going to be key. If guys are missing the green, chances are they're not going to be on the leaderboard on Sunday anyway. Um, in terms of course history, we've seen winning scores in the minus 17 to minus 20 range pretty much every single year. Nick Taylor, as you see here last year, won by four over Streelman. Um, year before, Mickelson won by three over Casey. Ted Potter won in 2018, minus 17. Spieth back in 2017, uh, minus 19. And then Vaughn Taylor, 2016, uh, won by a stroke over Phil. That's one thing with Phil is he seems to be in this every single year. So we'll talk about him here in a minute. Before we do that, a um, little bit on the weather side of things. The early forecast is showing about low to mid 50 temps all week. So fairly cool. Uh, it's actually very warm compared to the temperatures I'm dealing with right now. I would be like wearing shorts there all week. It would be just fantastic. But in for for the tournament, for them golf, and it's going to be a little bit cool. And we're going to want to pay attention to the winds. As of right now, Thursday looks fine, but it looks like the wind's picking up. Thursday night and then into Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So we're going to want to monitor that uh, Wednesday night more specifically for like our showdown targets. And then for that showdown as well, I think we should be looking at, you know, they're, they're pretty close in terms of uh, difficulty over the last few years, these courses, but uh, Pebble's obviously been a little bit harder. There's been a couple years where, yeah, three straight years there, uh, that would be 2019, 18, and 17 where Spyglass ranked outside the top 20 or sorry, outside the top 19 in terms of difficulty. Whereas um, Pebbles ranked inside the top 20 hardest courses in four of the last five years, top 10 once uh, that was last year as well. I think there was some win last year that made both courses top 10 hardest uh, courses on tour last year. So definitely going to want to pay attention to that weather. Um, so jumping in, what's your, you know, early in the week here, we're not really going to go through all of our plays because obviously there's going to be some things we're going to want to break down a little bit more, weather being one of them. Uh, but what's your general strategy this week, you know, balance versus stars and scrubs? I know in the intro you talked about DJ and some value. So is that kind of the route you're looking at so far? Yeah, I believe so. Um, I just think there's so much value that I'm going to end up liking down in this uh, lower 7K range that I can easily fit DJ in. 12,000 is not too much for him in this in this field. I mean, he's mm -mm. by far the best player. I mean, Cantlay, Berger, they're within some striking distance, but this guy's the best player in the world, and he's been firing on all cylinders for six to eight months now. Coming off um, another win. <laughs> yeah, coming off another win. I mean, I don't see that that's going to be a big deal for him. Um 
flying all the way over from Saudi Arabia. He's done it the last few years. He's obviously not had super high finishes the last two years, um, but he had a second and 18. I believe he played it that year um, yep. as well. So he came right over and done the same thing, I remember. Um, so DJ's, yeah, definitely my lean early this week is going to be Stars and Scrubs. Um, you could go balanced. I just think there's so much value to me in the sevens. Um, that's not much different than the 8K value um, that I feel like it makes sense for me to get up to DJ. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. DJ is kind of the class of the field. And, you know, to me, there's quite a big gap between DJ and then, you know, the Cantley, Casey, Berger, Zalatoris, all the other guys kind of in that yeah. 95 and up range. There seems to be quite a big gap for me. So it really... 12k he could probably be 12.5 and i think we could still get away with it so that's kind of the way i'm going to be leaning um i do have some plays here as you can see that are highlighted kind of in the mid-range so i do feel like there are some maybe in cash games i think you could probably go balance but for for gpps i think uh, going after dj is the way to go but if i was building 20 lineups i would probably um what i would do is take dj and maybe he's going to be probably in gpp 35 percent. i would say something like that. If he's going to be 35%, I'd probably go, you know, 40 to 50% exposure. And then the, those other lineups, I'd go contrarian and fade him so that you're kind of covered on both sides. If he does good, you've got say 10, 12 chances in that 20 max to hit versus um, on the other hand, if he doesn't work out, you've got eight chances to kind of capitalize on those contrarian lineups. You got to get me, you got to remind me Wednesday night to actually build a 20 max and, and force me to make time to do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I feel like I've been wanting to do it all year and I've just not had time really, but uh, I really want to build a 20 max with the pool that we, we make together, every week. Yeah. We both, do, we both yeah. go through and put our rankings up um, it, on, on your sheet every week. Um, Wednesday night, there's always rankings. So be sure to check that out. If you didn't know that was there, we, that's something new we started at the beginning of the year. Um, but yeah, with those pools, you could combine our pools and have a perfect 20 max, um, pool to build off of. For if you use an optimizer, sure. it's even easier. Oh yeah. You, you could take our yeah. plays or our rankings, uh, lock those, you know, three or four of those players in and run an optimizer or just build your own player pool on an optimizer. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of things you could definitely do, uh, with our player pool each and every week. Um, yeah. now we talked about DJ. I want to talk about just a couple other players that maybe stand out. Um, I'll kind of run one off here first. I, I really like Zalataris here. If you're going away from DJ, he's going to be right up there for me this week, just simply because, oh, I lost my screen here. There we go. Um, I like the price. <sighs> kind of for me, I'm hoping he's lower owned because of the DJ factor. I hope DJ's high owned because it's going to push some lower ownership on him. He doesn't have the course history. He was T68 back in 2018, but he's coming in red hot. Uh, he's gained almost seven strokes on approach over the last two events at the Farmers and the WMPO. Um, so I really like that. He's been excellent around the green. He's gained four strokes around the green in that time. So the irons are there. He's backing it up around the green. He lost 0.8 strokes putting last week. So that ended up at the T17, but he has shown us a ton of upside going back to the fall even. Um, at the U.S. Open, he was T6. Corrales, he was T8. Shriners, he was T5. T16 at Bermuda, T7 at Farmer. So he's shown a lot of upside. So I think we can definitely, in this field, with his irons that are on, really like that. And then uh, I promised, who I forget who it was in chat. I think it was Dobo in chat was uh, asking about Jason Day, and I promised that I would talk about him. He's my fade of the week. Um, I think he's going to see high ownership. When you look at that, Okay, I'm just going to flip over back to the sheet here and just kind of give me I'm a I'm glad second. you caught me with this so you can convince me before I was about to put in my bet on it. So. Oh, okay, okay. I seen that. I seen you were going to you were going to bet him and Ricky again. Um so I want to kind of give you why I am off of him. First of all, it's the ownership for DFS. Yeah. Uh you know, you look at that course history, that's going to drive the ownership. T4, T4, T2, T5, T11, yeah. T4 and a T6 in 2013. When you break that down and start looking at his performances um, coming in, like his form coming into that, all those events, almost every single one of them, he's had good form coming in. He does not have good form coming in. He's missed three of the last four cuts. Um, 
He's only gained the most he's gained with his irons is two and a half strokes. And that's the only time he's gained over two going all the way back to the PGA in August. He lost 6.5 strokes in the last two events. So that he's usually a guy we can count on to be a solid putter and not worry about. I know he's good on POA and he, he's really good here. But like I said, he's always come in with good form. Um, he could maybe find his form this week at a place he's very comfortable with, but he hasn't shown that in the past. When he comes in with good form, he does awesome here. I don't see the form to, to really get on day here this week. Uh, I don't know I'm, if that's I'm, enough. I might, jump, I might jump right on you. I mean, <laughs> I, I like I like any ownership fade that I can do, and, and sometimes I manufacture them in my head, and then it just right. burns me. But, um, yeah, I mean, I have not played Jason Day, and I, I don't know how long. I, I, I couldn't pick out the tournament. Last tournament I played Jason Day. Same. Um, the only thing that kind of tilted me toward him this week was – a little bit of that course history. Um, and last week, like you said, he had a decent tee to green game and lost five strokes putting, which you don't usually see, especially in two rounds with him. But, right. um, yeah, I mean, I think he's got a lot going on off the course. I think he's changed coaches or something too. Yeah. Obviously that didn't matter for Brooks last week, I guess, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think we could jump on that. Um, it's definitely going to be a popular play. Um, and it makes sense with the lineup construction as well. If you're going to go up to DJ, maybe you skip this range or go get an 8K guy um, or just pivot to a guy right around him. Um, yep. That takes – I can jump right into my two favorite yep. in this range. If I'm not going to DJ or pair one of these guys with DJ, it's going to be Berger or Molinari. So – Berger was the flop last week, barely missed the cut on the number. Friday was just kind of stagnant um, and moved a little bit backwards and burnt everybody. I think he, he was one of the highest on guys, um, at least in the contest that I was in. I think he was the second or third highest on. Um, but, man, this guy has been playing the best golf of his life um, since the restart last year. I'm, I'm perfectly fine giving him a one-day pass from Friday, fifth here last year, 10th um, in 2015 in the two trips that he's been to this event. Mm -hmm. um, I think Berger is a prime bounce-back candidate. He's, he is 10-1, which is fairly expensive. Um, I've obviously not built lineups, so it might be a little tough to, to jam him in there. But I think with some of the track record we see with these – lower end guys popping for top five finishes, especially in this event. Um, I think stars and scrubs makes a lot of sense this week. And the other guy for me, I don't know how popular he's going to be. I know he's got some steam in recent weeks just because he's kind of started coming back. And I don't think he's played here. At least he's definitely not played here since 2011 um, on your sheet. Molinari has kind of regained a little bit of form now he's 9,300. He is priced up. I'll be interested to see Wednesday night what his ownership looks like. Yeah. He's definitely one you could easily pair with, with DJ, I believe, at 9-3, and then just drop into that 7K range and get your favorite guys. Um, but Molinari, at the uh, eighth at the Amex, 10th at the Farmers, he's gained everywhere T to green in his game in both of those events. 4.1 on approach at the Farmers, 2.9 at the Amex in the measured uh, rounds at both of those, which is three of the four. Um, he was pretty flat with the putter. Um, but, man, I love to see 2.1 off the tee for a guy that you don't think is is usually a, a bomber or anything that's going to be gaining tons of strokes off the tee. And then that approach play um, came back a little bit from – back to what we saw when he made that super hot run oh yeah in the summer of 2018 so um he's definitely one of my favorite plays hopefully he's going to come in lower he's definitely going to be lower on the day i would think yeah um so he's a direct pivot off of jason day um and maybe people are scared off of him because of the um no course history here i I love that play. I hadn't even thought of Molinar yet. I just kind of looking at it here, looking at those stats. Like you said, he's gained seven strokes and approached those last two events, top tens in both. Um, what else you said off the tee that was good. What else stood out to me was his around the green game. He gained strokes 
around the green in both those events too. So off the tee approach and around the green, and he was right about uh, field average in putting. So I'm with you with Molinari. I think there's a lot of opportunity in this top range with, I think we're going to end up with Day being one of the highest owned um, from the 9,000 range, as well as DJ. I think people are either going to go DJ, uh, Stars and Scrubs, or they're going to go like maybe pick two of these guys uh, in the 10 for like Casey and down and pick two of those guys and go with them or J- like Jason Day and another one. So I think there's going to be a lot of ownership there. So I, I really like the Burger, Zalatara, Smilinari, all of our picks there really make some nice pivots off of that ownership. Uh, this is a fun range, this top range this week. Now, to make it all work, I'm just going to slide right past that mid range here and just kind of go down. Who are some of the value guys you're looking at this week to make it all work? Yeah, so I, I love this 7K range. It's definitely my favorite um, this week. There's a couple. These are the ones that I joked pre-show that I, you were going to laugh at. Um, some of them, it's just some of the names. One you probably won't is Varner, uh, 77. He looked very good last week, T to green. He, I rode him in showdown a lot of the week, 13th. Um, knocked some of that rust off at the Farmers, and then he was uh, gained almost five strokes on approach last week um flat with the putter gained a little bit off the tee and if i'm remembering he doesn't have super course history here um 77th i believe that's still i feel like he made the cut or he had one good round uh last year i think he was had a hot first nine or something at pebble beach which at least shows me that he can play the event (laughs) and play at pebble beach um so that's something we can check on as the week goes along too, but Varner, Tita Green, he's he's one of my favorite in the top seven. Um, jumping down to the lower, which is definitely where I like that range. Um, this is one you might scoff at a little bit. Uh, Joel Damon, he's a guy that we've played a lot, but his form is not there. That is 100% sure. Uh, missed three cuts in a row to start 2021, um, but he does have good history here. Um, he's not been very far off from making these cuts, I don't believe. 67th, and he was he was way off a couple weeks ago, um, and then 93rd. But he, he's trending a little bit in the right direction. He's 7,400, gained off the tee and on approach uh, last week at the Waste Management. His game fits this course, obviously, with um, his result um, last year, 14th. He's made the cut every time, the last three times he's played here. So he's one of my favorites. Um, And then one more at 7,200, Mark Hubbard. He's been in some very good form, I feel. Um, At least he pops in some um, events since back since the the Wyndham, I think, was one of the first ones. When I was at the Wyndham, he, he popped on that leaderboard 15th. Um, and he had, and he had a fairly strong end of the year in the fall. CJ Cup 17th, uh, made the cut in pretty much every event except the RSM there. 30th last week, gained everywhere except around the green. So a, a solid week. And he, he was up there first couple rounds yep. um, last week. I think he was like a co-leader after the first round. So he's trending in the right direction. He's just got to put four rounds together. And for that price – um and the course history of at least having these cuts um he had a 26 and 2016 so he's one of my favorites there at 7200 and i think last year i i I wrote him up to last year in this event i think he has some major ties to this area um and went to college right around here played spyglass and and pebble beach quite a bit during that time uh so that just increases my my um liking for Hubbard and then one last guy I'll throw out there he's he was one of the guys that um I played a ton a couple years ago Bronson Burgoon mm-hmm. um, that's definitely one you're gonna laugh at um but he does have decent history here he's 21st and in, in 16 47th and 18 um I'm trying to pull up his strokes gain numbers because I've not even looked at that but he could be a a GPP play he's gonna be like probably two percent on or one percent on um but at the farmers he was 42nd made the cut gained everywhere except when you got closer to the greens which is normal for him 3.6 on approach and 2.6 
on approach at the Amex. So he's at least making some cuts, and he's right at 7,000 in not such a strong field. So he could pop um, in GPPs for sure. Not a cash play ever. He's – He's actually ranked 31st in this whole field on my sheet in birdie or better, too. So there's your upside. He's made the cut here twice. Uh, a T21 was his best in 2016. If you can get a T21 out of a guy that's right around 7K that's making birdies, not just a par T21, par out, um, that that's awesome. Oh, he's not a par out guy. I'll tell no, you that. <laughs> he's a birdie or bogey or worse. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then, no, I like your, your Hubbard pick. He's had some solid finishes. Same thing for that price. He's when he's making the cut, he's like 30 T thirties, T forties. And that's not going to kill you um, at all in your lineup, especially if those guys are making birdies. So I don't think any of those plays are, are crazy. Damon's a little crazy just because of his, to me, his form, but he like he's going to be one percent owned. Yeah, um, he's got good course history here, and looking at his strokes gain stats lately, it isn't that crazy because he's not losing like four strokes uh, approach or five strokes off the tee or six strokes putting. He's you know right around field average on all of his all of his uh, strokes gain stats recently. It's just he's not popping in one area or putting two areas having you know having a good week in two areas all at once. So I think that form's going to start coming back again. And as it starts coming back for those guys, you know, that those streaks for players really start coming in bunches. Like two or three weeks in a row, you'll see a guy put up top 25s, top 30s. I know we've seen that, even seen that out of Kevin Knox um, before. Kevin Knox, that's uh, basketball. Sorry about that. That's uh, New York Knicks there. Russell Knox, <laughs> his golf, <laughs> his golf and brother. Um, but yeah, he, we've seen streaks out of him before, like, four or five top 25s in a row guys just get those irons on and they go. So when you start seeing a player get into form, um, don't one mistake I make, I know we've, we've talked about this before in previous videos. My bit, one of the biggest things I do in season long or season long in DFS going from week to week, or even betting outrights is I'll play a guy one week that's coming into form. And that's the reason I'm playing him because he's coming into form or I'll bet him outright. He'll let me down and I will go away from him the next week when I do that and he'll always pop, like it seems like 80% of the time he'll pop a week later, but I'm not on him. So what I've really tried to train myself is if I'm on a guy because of form, not course history, but coming in with good form, irons are getting to where we want to see them. All the parts of the game, ball striking, putting's coming along, even for some guys, I'm going to ride that player for three weeks. If I bet him outright this week and I've decided it's a form play, I'm going to bet him this week, next week, and the week after maybe not the week out it all depends on his tournament it could be three weeks away till his next tournament or four weeks away but that player's next two or three tournaments before because i want to avoid the variance and i want to get a, a piece of the high without missing it because of one bad week if that makes any right sense and, and dom and shot dom and shot 65 on friday after and mit, still missed the cut yep um last week so that's just one of those maybe he put it together on friday it was a little bit putting he gained three strokes putting that day but he was positive throughout his bag um so maybe he's one to hop on there so who's some of your favorites in this range and then i'm going to get your thoughts speaking of that betting people for multiple weeks i'm going to get your thoughts on a guy after we um after you go through this value range all right um this one's a little it's more of a mid-range value. He's my favorite mid-range play is Naismith. Um, he's gained over like 12.1 strokes on approach the last two weeks. He went from losing 4.8 strokes at the farmer's putt in uh, and got a T48. Almost gained, he actually gained less strokes on approach at the waste management last week, but he gained 3.7 strokes putt in and has a T10. I see somewhere in the middle with his putt in, um, gain one or two strokes with those hot irons. I can see him uh, popping off here again this week. Uh, Kyle Stanley stands out as well. I will scroll down to look at him here. Uh, he hasn't played here since 2016, but he's made the cut in three of his last four events. He's coming in again, nice irons. He's gained 9.2 strokes, actually 11.2 strokes over his last three events. That's a T32 at the Amex, T18 at the Farmers, T36 last week. He's lost strokes putting in all three of those and 4.6 last week. It can't get any worse than that, can it? He's got to start turning towards <laughs> field average putting. I there. remember all of last week. I, I felt <laughs> like I was right there with him for all the six strokes he lost. And then uh, one guy going down, I don't know what to do with Nick Taylor. He feels more of a GPP play to me. 
he didn't come in with the greatest of form last year when he won. It was a missed cut in T49 before he that win, and then he missed the cut the next week in T46 and T56 after that. Um, this, he's not really coming in. Like, it was a T11 at Sony, T47 at Amex, but then he missed the cut. So he's kind of trending away with his form. He's losing strokes on approach over the last four weeks on average. I don't know really what to do with him, but he'd be a GPP play for sure. I think he's going to take on ownership being the defending champion in that range, though. So I'm probably going to be a little bit underweight on him. If you want to go real cheap, uh, Sam Ryder was one that kind of stood out. He's made the cut in three straight. Uh, he popped with the T10 at the Farmers. Uh, a little bit more risky. He's been terrible around the green and putting uh, pretty much every single week. So very risky there as well. But I haven't gone too deep down into the into the value range yet. I kind of do that on Tuesday. So keep your eye out on the sheet for some more value plays coming up. So hit me up with your betting question here. I'm ready. Kind of nervous. Yeah. So, uh, so I got I got distracted there. Kevin Chapels apparently back in the field. Um, uh, not I've been playing him years ago. But anyway, <laughs> um, the guy I was gonna ask you about. So Ricky Fowler, we were on him last week, one and done. Um, of course, screwed me um, in DFS as well. Um, but man, I mean. <laughs> I'm surprised to see that he's not played in this event since 2012, but I watched, we, we watched his entire rounds on PGA tour live on, mm-hmm. on Thursday and Friday end of Thursday. He looked kind of uninterested um, bogey, like three in a row. And, and that just done him in. I mean, he, he played a solid round from everything that I could see on Friday, except not being able to putt. Yeah. If he would have rolled in some of those putts, he would have made the cut even after the, the Thursday round. Um, but man, last I checked, and this may have changed at this point, I'll pull it up. But on DraftKings Sportsbook, he was 55 to 1 to win. Oh, and he wow. was worse. He was better than that. He, I think we bet, I bet him last week at like 45. Yeah. Um, I got 42. How do I not bet him at 55 in a less field? Oh. I mean, Brooks missed three cuts in a row. And then one, you got. He's me. got the talent. I still see fifty to one out there myself. That's on Bet three sixty five. I think I seen uh, fifty two to one on my CoolBet dot com. But no, I'm with you. And looking at the stats here, he's gained strokes putting and around the green in three straight events um, at the Amex Farmers and the Waste Management. But the putter is just that. I I forget what hole it was. He he was putting. It was like fifteen feet, and he missed the line by like four feet it missed like I missed butts, like totally read it wrong. It broke right instead of left. I was just shook my head at that. But if he can turn that around, um, like you said, the irons have been there. The, the chipping around the green has been there. The off the tee is going to be there for him. I just 50 to one, like you said, just seems like a crazy number for him. I mean, you don't got to go crazy and go like three, four units or anything on uh, Ricky Fowler by any means, but 50 to one, no. uh, Brooks was 50 to one last week. People still thought that was crazy and wouldn't lay money on it. Uh, I'll raise my hand here. I missed out on the Brooks 50 to one train last week. Uh, so I think Ricky is definitely going to be there and I'd really love to see Ricky, you know, get on board, but look at the other players in his range. Tell me if you think any of these players could win Sam Burns. I don't really see him as a winner yet. Max Holm has got a 40 to one number attached to him. Cameron Davis, 40 to one Streelman, 40 to one Henrik Norlander, 50 to one, like, uh, Tringali, 55 to one Fowler, is the name in that area that I would be betting. If I'm picking anyone in that range, it's Fowler. Maybe Burns at 40 to 1, but still, I'll take Ricky at 50 over Burns at 40. Imagine betting Jordan Spieth at 30 to 1 after <laughs> one week last week and not betting Ricky Fowler at 25 points higher. You just nailed it right there. Lock that one and in. And he's going to win. <laughs> Ricky Fowler, yeah. It's going to come out win by Spieth's six. winning. <laughs> I can't. Speed's <laughs> number is down to twenty-five to one for me here on this one. On oh, that three, six, oh. Like, oh my gosh, you're you're you're. Uh, that's like stock market buying high and selling low, <laughs> right there. And he, <laughs> I don't even want to say buying high on him because that final round, while he was still in it, um, you know, pretty close to the end of his round, it wasn't pretty at all. <laughs> it was a pretty ugly final round for him. Um, but it was nice to see him. That was one thing I really did enjoy and looked forward to going into that final round was not just all the names yeah. that were up there, but seeing Spieth on the top of the leaderboard. It's been so long. Uh, what was that, 2018, the Open? 
He yeah, was in the leader I, I remember where I was at because yeah. I had a, a ticket on Matt Kuchar. So, <laughs> yep. Yeah, that was wild times. So, I wonder that's another thing for DFS. I wonder what people are going to do with Jordan Speed this week at nine, now 9,700. Yeah. Had success here, obviously. Yep. Uh, Fade for me. Even last year. I but, just, I can't get back on Speed yet. I just, I don't no. know. The price when no I chance. Price stayed Not, down, maybe I'd consider like an 8K range or something for DFS or in the 50 to 1 range for betting. But being that he had three solid rounds there and that number jumped everywhere, uh, no, I'm back off him. I, I was kind of hoping, you know, that he would maybe suck last week and we could get on him cheap this week, but that definitely didn't happen. So, yeah, he's definitely going to be a fade. So, <laughs> um, who is your early lean for one and done? Before we get out of here. Um, I'm not having the same success as last year, Dane. Not at all. Um, but I'm I'm not using DJ yet, although this is a good event where you probably could get away with using DJ. But I'm not. Just because of the last two years, I want to see him get back in that top five range. Yeah, I mean, he hasn't won here um, in the last 10 years. I mean, there's top twos, top threes all over the place. Long story short, right now on my list, top three, Zalataris, uh, Sam Burns, um, and you got me thinking Rick, Ricky Fowler. Now I know we, we together used Ricky Fowler in our one contest. Um, I'm, I went back in that, uh, it's not guff now. What is it? Carbon contests. Um, yeah. and I haven't used Fowler yet. I almost pulled the trigger last week. Um, didn't really matter. I forget who I chose. Doesn't matter. He missed the cut anyway. So it really wouldn't matter who I chose. Just a terrible, <laughs> terrible start this year. You, what are you going with? Yeah. Um, so my initial leans are, are kind of that top range, a touch off of DJ, kind of um, a burger bounce back, um, or the Molinari are, are my two favorite ones. Um, I don't know how popular either of those would be this week, but those are probably my two favorites in that top range. This is an event if you didn't want to burn one of those for some reason. I mean, uh, that's kind of the thing I've got um in trouble with in the past is going down and mm-hmm. early in the year taking these guys that um i'm ne- definitely never going to use again but then i don't use somebody in a weak field that i probably wouldn't use again anyway because there's just not enough events so right those are my two favorites for this week would be a burger for bounce back um or molinari i really like the burger and for dfs as well um I know I didn't talk about him a whole bunch, but I'm I'm with you there as a as a pivot. I think, like I said, Day and Johnson are going to command some ownership, so I think we can go to some of those guys. And like you said, a T67 last week, he burned some people with some ownership. Um, he's going to be probably 5% less owned this week just on that alone. Um, so I definitely like that, and I'm with you on Berger. I might even just change my one and done to him. Oh, also, for showdown this week, as always, um, we can definitely help you out for round one, but we, what I've been concentrating on um, since 2021 rolled around, since the Tournament of Champions and the Sony Open, I am not playing round one, but I play round two to four quite heavy. It's It's been a heck of a ride here so far. I think I hit like eight of the last nine showdowns or something in terms of cash games. I'm, I'm just play cash games most. I'm about 90%. So make sure to check in with us each and every day. I update the exact same sheet. After every round, uh, live tournament stats, um, that's like greens and regulation, birdies, DraftKings scoring, ownership, all that kind of stuff, um, as well as we have uh, lineups for you, our skeleton lineups for you uh, each and every round, as well as our top plays for those as well. And a lot of information that we provide in chat, uh, in the Slack chat, in the PGA channel, um, just giving you weather updates, player updates, strokes gained updates, anything um, you want, and, and we're there to answer questions pretty much uh, leading up to every single day for lock for you. So, um, yeah. again, if you're not a Rotor Pros member, get over to rotorpros.com. Get a free trial. Get in and check us out. Uh, three and seven day trials available. And if you sign up um, today, use R- Roto, or sorry, Rotor Pros RP20. Um, I, I just couldn't spit that out for some reason. RP20 is what you want to use, or RP50 this week. Sorry, you're going to get 50% off your first payment after your trial is up. So that's pretty good value there. Any last words? think that'll do it um be sure to check out my article will be up tomorrow night um i'll dive in a little bit more um into some of these plays that i've already mentioned and then some more um just in more detail um 
the, the way I would use my article, I, I definitely talk about some strategy. Um, I've already talked about probably the strategy that I'm going to put in the article here on, on this video, but um, I give tons, like we were talking about earlier with our rankings Wednesday night, the, the article has notables in each range as well that you can use to just build out a pool for the 20 max type build. I mean, start playing the quarter 20 max or the $1 20 max, whatever your bankroll allows. And you can really build with our player pools, uh, build 20 lineups and have a, a nice pool, I believe, because I think, I feel like we do a great job of hitting on quite a few plays. There, there's a few here and there, obviously, that, that screw us, it feels like each week. But mm -hmm. um, that happens having, to everyone. Having that 20 max pool, I think we could, you could definitely build a good pool of 20. Uh, lineups and and whether you want to be diverse or not uh, whether you want to build like a core uh, and maybe go with like 12 players and keep a tight core for 20 max or whether you're someone that wants to get exposure to more players you can definitely go that route too uh, kind of cover some more bases yeah. and i would go you know on a 20 max i'm either looking at like 12 to 15 player pool for a like a if i really feel comfortable about 12 to 15 players this week like three or four in each range that's the way I'm going to go. If I'm not, and I'm not as comfortable with those players, I'm going to stretch that out to probably 15 to 18, sometimes even 20 players and just kind of diversify my lineups a little bit more. And it all depends on the week. So, um, and it's really what you're comfortable with. If you're comfortable putting a guy in your lineup, 60% uh, of your lineups in a 20 max and just kind of building around him so that if he goes off, you're going to have a darn good chance of taking down a GPP. Um, then that's, that's a definite good route to go. You just really have to, be strong willed because you're going to have a few weeks in a row where that's not going to work out where two of your core plays that are in your line is 50 60 percent of the time are going to burn you and you're, you're going to end up with nothing versus your diversified lineup it's harder to hit the win on the gpp but you're also not going to lose it all every single week so you're, you're going to be able to sustain it a little bit longer so again you mentioned it with bankroll management that's definitely going to be key in how you build your lineup so if you want to learn more hit us up in chat, DM us, hit us up in the PGA channel. We are there to help you with everything DFS, not just lineups and players. Thanks a lot. Uh, I hope you guys join us in chat. we got a lot coming up here for the rest of the week. we got two days to lock, um, Tuesday and Wednesday to go through stuff. Thursday morning is going to be locked. So uh, hit us up in chat. Let's go get some green screens this week. Good luck, everyone.